in uh, God is good and all the time as I stood here I just had could not uh, resist the impulse to sing something that my dear friend sister Antona Ebo would want to start singing right now oh lord I want somebody here to catch on fire catch on fire catch on fire I want somebody here to catch on fire burning with the Holy Ghost oh yes I want somebody here to catch on fire Let us stand and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty, eternal God, it is once again that a few of your chosen people have come together and call upon your holy name to strengthen and renew us as we gather on this holy ground. Keep us mindful, O Lord, of your grace and mercy that shines forth before us, especially through the lives of all those who have gone before us, marked with the sign of faith. We pray that in a special way, as we gather in your name, we may truly hold on to the value of our faith, its power and its, its action within our lives that renews and strengthens your people, and call them to hold on. To keep on believing and trusting in you. We ask in a special way that as we come together at this time. That you empower us with the spirit of your mercy. And your grace. Those two twins that truly are so good for us. And so necessary for us to keep on living our lives in you. We pray in thanksgiving for all those who have gone before us, who have shown us the way to keep alive the faith we profess. May we carry on that tradition, believing, trusting, like them, in the power of your Spirit. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, as you know, we are celebrating our 50th anniversary, and as we've heard, the um, city of New Orleans is celebrating its 300th anniversary, and so a lot of history is coming together this week, right as we gather. And our being here today is also an intertwining of various histories. So history is playing an important role in our gathering today. So welcome and, um, and God bless you. I promised you a historic event <clears throat> and I would like to invite Dr. Reynolds Verrett, president of Xavier University, to let you know why you're here. Please. Well, welcome home, all of you. Welcome to Xavier. And may this day be a day of blessing for many as we go forward. Today, I'm proud to announce to this audience and to the larger world, with representatives from around the country at this joint conference at Xavier University of Louisiana, its Institute of Black Catholic Studies, the Most Reverend Bishop Joseph Perry, represented by the Reverend Canon Gerald, Gerard, Gerard Jordan, O'Prem, will come together in an effort to promote the five causes for sainthood of the Catholic Church that were born from the black Catholic community. Xavier and the ICBS will serve as hosts and administrators 
of the joint effort that will, that will be moderated and shared by Bishop Perry, bonding the causes and their respective guilds working towards the canonization of these five causes for sainthood. With the goal of establishing scholarly works and relevant academic studies of the current day concerns that each of the following persons focused on in their lifetimes. The cause, as many of you well know, are, first of all, the Venerable Pierre Toussaint, the Venerable Henriette de Lille, Servant of God, Mother Mary Elizabeth Lang, Servant of God, Father Augustus Tolton, Servant of God, Julia Greeley. And I would also note, while we celebrate these five causes, we all know that there is one more who is dear to our hearts here at Xavier, and among all of you, Sister Thea Bowman. We understand we are somewhat premature because she will be announced in November, to my understanding. And today I commit to you that she will be included in this effort. At that time, and in her honor, we will host a special celebration here at Xavier for our beloved Sathya. And we pray and plan for this official announcement, and we look forward to it with great expectation. We, I and the staff here at Xavier will inform you of that celebration. I, it is important for us to note that our eventual goal in the establishment of a resource center for scholarly work on the lives and work of these five, soon to be six candidates for sainthood, and the St. Catherine, Catherine Drexel, Sister Kateri Tekawitha, their lives and efforts will be presented in relevant, current, education, edu educable ways to bring the, their lives to the many and publicly advance their causes. I ask you for prayers as we do this, because we will work and we'll, I'm sure we will face some difficulties, so that this work will be realized. Catholic institutions of higher learning in our nations and the home of this ICBS will share this great work with the greater Catholic Church. Thank you. <laughs> Make it happen. Thank you. It has been a while since the joint conference has been at Xavier University. The last time you were here was 1984. We had our joint conference here, and it was also to commemorate the first graduating class of the Institute for Black Catholic Studies. I would like to ask if you were a participant in the founding, teaching, directing, learning, staffing, promoting the Institute for Black Catholic Studies, please stand. I want to give some special recognition because I'm at that age and I'm in front of the microphone. <clears throat> Four of the members of the original six students are with us today. Bishop Fernand Cherie. <laughs> Sister Dr. Addie Lorraine Walker. <laughs> Sister Patricia Chappelle. Father Jim Velker from East St. Louis was number four. Father Joseph Plummer from Houston, who died too soon, was number five. And I was number six. Now, even though some of these Christians took the extended plan of finishing the program... Two of the uh, th three original graduates are here, Sister Addie Lorraine Walker and myself. This is a special place. It is a special place because it was built for a special purpose. 
It is a place that understands the woes, but also the giftedness of the African-American community. It is a place, as Sister Jamie Phelps pointed out for us so clearly during our joint conference, that knows you do not have to sacrifice your identity in order to open your arms to the world. It is a place that understands the gift of blackness that we keep affirming it, we keep acknowledging it, we keep nurturing it, we keep celebrating it, because it is not a gift only for ourselves. We live in a world, Pope Paul VI told us, that desperately needs, and a church as well, that desperately needs the gift of blackness. It is not just a matter of being included. It is helping to build the house. It is not just a matter of being, of being a class in a school. It's about building the curriculum. It is not just about singing our songs in church, but it's talking about a familiar deity. It is not just about moving into the neighborhood, but helping to build the society that governs what's right and wrong where these people live. We are glad for this joint effort towards canonization because what we are witnessing in some cases are ordinary people who did extraordinary things. But we are also witnessing extraordinary people who understood the ultimate frame of reference of ordinary things. We are here because we know that God has been using black people to save the world since the beginning of time, and we have said, sign me up. Here I am, send me. We are here because we know that those who have gone before us understood clearly that they might not see the fruits of their labor in their lifetime, but they did what was right anyway. We are here because now we know we were made for these times. We were here because there is no place like Xavier University, and we helped to make Xavier University what it is. Before you leave this place, I would invite you to take a walk around the room and see the stones of those our ancestors who have gone before, because as the proverb says, if you journey the path of your ancestors, you will learn to walk like them. I invite you to walk around the room and see the stones. These stones travel with the light conference wherever it goes. I would also invite you, please, that if you know there is a name that is missing, would you let me know? And Bishop Cherie has assured us, it might not be this year, but before the light conference opens its doors again, that person's name will be added to the path, a signpost, a signpost of how to stand tall, how to walk tall, how to do right. Welcome to Xavier University. In the absence of Brother Tyrone Davis, I would like to invite Father Gerard Jordan to please come forward, who will address us on Pierre Toussaint. On behalf of Brother Tyrone, who I spoke to, he attempted to be with us. He sends his regrets. Um, Brother Tyrone simply wants you to know the good news is, is that the cause of Venerable Pierre Toussaint is standing strong in New York. And then he said it's standing strong in America. And then he said it's standing strong in the islands. And he said, most of all, it's standing strong around the universal church around the world. And that's what you're going to hear about all these candidates for sainthood. They're universal saints for everybody, not just for your respective geographical area or your respective religious community or whatever your bias may be. And I reminded Brother Tyrone, I said, you know, the reason that we partnered with Xavier and prayed through the intercession of Mother Catherine Drexel and St. Kateri, because 
It's not a competition, it's a communion. Y'all say that with me. It's not a competition, it's a communion. And in the communion, Pierre Toussaint led the way and opened the doors. I need your prayers, though. He said, do two things. Tell the people that we need their prayers. But first of all, we're going to pray the intercessory prayer that Pierre Toussaint has circulating around the world. The second thing we need your prayers for is the postulator, the seat, the person that postulates the cause for Pierre Toussaint is vacant. Without your calls, without your cries, without your letters, without your inquiries to the local bishop of that area, the Cardinal Archbishop, we need to let them know that we would like a postulator in place. That's very key. So we continue our prayer. Lord God, source of love and compassion, we praise and honor you for the virtuous and charitable life of our brother in Christ, Venerable Pierre Toussaint. Inspired by the example of our Lord Jesus, Pierre worshiped with you in love and served your people with generosity. He responded to the practical and spiritual needs of his friends and strangers, of the rich and the poor, the sick, the homeless of his time. By following his example, and asking for his prayers, may we too be counted among the blessed in heaven. And through his intercession, may our prayers connect with that same heaven. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Present to us at Xavier University the cause of Mother Elizabeth Lang, Sister Magdala Marie Gilbert. Thank you, David. Three minutes. Thank you. You can do it, girl. What can I say? You can do it. Two will be fine. As I said, I'm Sister Magdalene Marie Gilbert. I'm the director for the cause of the canonization of Mother Mary Elizabeth Lane. And you know, the Mother Lane was a woman uh, ahead of her time. She was a no-nonsense woman. She knew what she had to do. And she went on and did it. In those days when you were walking around Baltimore, Baltimore, it was still a safe slave state. 32 years before the Emancipation Proclamation, anybody could snatch you off the street and make you a slave. But Mother Lane wasn't worried about that. She took hold of her God, the hand of God, and she went on and educated children of color. And she, she did a whole lot of things that in Baltimore that wasn't proper in those days, but what can we say? When you have God at your side, you fear nothing. Come on. Well, they told me I just had three minutes, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, rush it on through. The Alvin Sisters of Providence, of course, began, uh, was founded in 1829 uh, by a uh, a woman of Haitian background in Santiago de Cuba, working along with four other sisters and the help of Father Joubert, they founded the Alvarez Sisters of Providence. In 1991, it was decreed that this was an extraordinary woman, and so the cause of canonization of Mother Lang began. We had a postulator who did he was he was very good but brother um, Reginald Cruz but he had too many other obligations so it was deemed that someone else should take his place and so about Two or three months ago, we were given a new postulator. And the postulator is, uh, is from Rome. It's called Roman uh, postulator. And I think they call him the external collaborator. And this external collaborator is Dr. Emanuela 
fedicator. I, I hope that's right. Anyway, the the Posicio is a, is a book that is written about the life of the of the person that's to, to be canonized, and so we were waiting for this book to be written by, Father, by Brother Cruz, but it was he had too many uh, other he had about two hundred uh, other um, clients. So we so the we were given Father um, Doctor Hilgerman, who is a Roman postulator, talked to Sister our congregational leader, and the, so they decided to give us a new external postulator. And it is said that our Presidio should be ready this October. Praise God. And hopefully, after that, we will, she will be called venerable. And we have, we did a mass for the miracle for Mother Lane. And so far, it hasn't said, it, they haven't told us that it wasn't right. So perhaps when we get the Pasisio done, then the miracle will soon follow because it, it is, it will be sent to, to Rome and she will be a saint sooner than we expect. Thank you so much, and have a good, blessed day. Now I would like to invite Sister Greta Jupiter to come and address us on Mother Henriette DeLille. Good afternoon. Uh, you heard a lot about uh, our foundress. Well, Sister Laura gave you a very good overview of the life of Henriette DeLille when you visited the Mother House this afternoon, so I'm not going to repeat what she said. I was asked to give an update on the cause. As you know, the road to sainthood uh, comes in four stages. You first have the first stage as a servant of God, the second is venerable, the third is blessed, and the fourth is sainthood. And so um, Henriette, in 1988, she was accepted as a candidate for sainthood by the Congregation for Causes of the Saints in Rome. She became, at that time, the first United States native-born African-American person to be officially recognized by Rome as a candidate for sainthood. Later, a position was sent, that is, a position paper, telling of her life after they had interviewed several people. She was recognized as a person who lived who had heroic, who lived a heroic virtuous life. And in 2010, Pope Benedict XVI proclaimed her venerable. So she is now venerable Henriette de Lille. The next stage is blessed. And in order to be recognized by the church as blessed, a miracle has to be approved by Rome. We did send a miracle, um, an alleged miracle, in 2005. And that was in regards to a four-year-old girl who was cured uh, after they constantly prayed to Henriette de Leon. They are still inquiring on that and asking for more information. But because it had taken uh, place and the process took a long period of time, some of the x-rays uh, that they had taken on her they were, the hospital no longer had it. And of course, you know, the doctors move out, etc. So we are now presenting to them another alleged miracle, which occurred in Little Rock, Arkansas. And that miracle is a 19-year-old college student was attending college in Little Rock, Arkansas. Her parents live here in New Orleans. And she was experiencing some excruciating headaches, and she called her mother to tell her about it. And as they spoke on the phone, the mother said, you need to go to the hospital. And that she did. A couple of hours later, the doctor called the mother to say that her daughter was unresponsive and she was experiencing a brain aneurysm and that they needed to come as soon as possible because they didn't know how long she was going to live. And they put her on a ventilator because they wanted to make sure that she was still alive when they came. So when they came, they did see that she was unresponsive, and she eventually went into a coma. And so the parents who did have um, 
some devotion to Henriette de Lille, they called the sisters and they asked the sisters to put her on the prayer list for healing, on Henriette's prayer list, which the sisters did and they started praying. And the family began saying the prayer to Henriette de Lille. And about a week later, she went into a deeper coma and the doctor was saying that she wasn't going to live because of the fact that her kidneys had completely shut down, her organs were failing, and she was no longer breathing on her own. But the parents insisted that she would remain on the ventilator, and they continued to pray. And about a week later, they noticed that she was not doing as well as she had begun before. She was gradually declining. But on Christmas Day, the mother looked, and she saw that there was a little drop of urine in the catheter. And so she told the doctor about this, and also that her eyes started flickering. He said, well, that's involuntary movement. But, you know, he said, as far as the urine, he said, that's probably not urine, because once the kidneys fail and shut down like that, they don't revive themselves. But, you know, the mother had hope, and she continued to pray and pray, and so, after a while, they saw more urine in the catheter. And then, eventually, she began breathing on her own. And so, today, she has completed college, and she's moving on to higher education. So, that has been presented to Rome. Uh, it's not completely, the process of that is not complete yet, in that the postulator from Rome had to go to Little Rock, Arkansas, they interviewed the girl, they interviewed her family, the doctors, the nurses, and anyone who witnessed that, that healing process. And then they got all the information, test results, x-rays, etc. cetera. So uh, in May, they emailed me to let me know that that inquiry in Little Rock, Arkansas was complete. And that now all the information has been sent to Rome and they're in the second process of that where they will begin to write what they call a positio, the position paper. And that will be presented to the doctors in Rome and to the theologians there who will have to say that this is something that occurred beyond medical means and that had to be something supernatural. So right now we're asking for prayers that that will happen, that the doctors and the theologians and the cardinals and whoever else has to approve it will say that truly it was a miracle. And they can present that to the Pope, and Pope Francis will say that, yes, she is blessed, venerable, um, blessed Henriette de Lille. So that's the, the next stage, the blessed stage. And after that, we would need one more miracle, and then she will become St. Henriette de Lille. So we ask for your prayers that this will happen, and we can all celebrate here in New Orleans her beatification and then eventually in Rome her canonization. So I thank you very much. And you can, <clears throat> if you don't say her whole prayer, you can say the mantra that she did say, I believe in God, I hope in God, I love, I want to live and die for God. Thank you. To address us on Father Augustus Tolton, I would invite Reverend Canon Gerard Jordan. On behalf of Bishop Joseph Perry, the postulator for the cause for the canonization of Father Augustus Tolton, in his absence, he's in the Holy Land today, and I have the privilege of sharing with you the updates on Father Tolton's cause. As you all know, Father Tolton, a former slave from a farm in northeast Missouri, is the first recognizably African-American priest in this country. His mother, Martha Jane, and his father, Peter Paul, their two siblings escaped from slavery. And with the help of the underground, during the nation's civil war time, they wind up in freedom in the state of Illinois and Instead of leaving their faith on the other side of the Mississippi, the first thing they did was check into the local church to give thanks. And it was from there Father Tolton's vocation was recognized with the help of the many white parishioners and two white priests, as well as the black community of freed slaves. And there, even though Father Tolton's 
vocation was recognized early as a little boy, he was refused entrance into the American seminaries and thank God for the Franciscans because they maneuvered their connections they had in Rome to get Father Tolton into the prestigious Propaganda Fide Seminary and the Urban College. And if you don't know your history, since that time there's only been two other men of African-American descent that have went to that Propaganda Fide Seminary and Urban College. One of them didn't persist and persevere. Father Tolton helped pay for this young man's tuition and then he fell off the pages of history. We don't know what happened to that young man but I hear the other young man may be with us today. Monsignor, where are you? Stand up, brother. <laughs> Monsignor crossed one of those stones that Sister Eva talked about. His footprint is still there. He was ordained a priest with his class on Holy Saturday, April 24, 1886. Father Tolton was assigned to work in his home diocese of Alton, Illinois, where he labored for three years but suffered persecution from Protestants and Catholics alike, from blacks and whites. Father Tolton was rescued when he had to flee for his life for the second time because the bounty was on his head. Father Patrick Fian accepted him in the Archdiocese of Chicago. The most important gift that Father Tolton gives the church is that his life is a, a life of courage when he could have just hid under his cassock and lived a life of privilege. He persevered under great odds when he could have just stayed in the rectory with his mother and his sister, very comfortable. His priestly openness at the National Black Catholic Congress gave us a leader when other leaders in the church, a black bishop who was working through some things. <laughs> and regardless of his race, his condition, he was humble and obedient to the call to serve the church. And he built a church of diversity. The whites and blacks came from far and near. Don't believe that he just had a black church. He didn't. There were white people sitting in the pews by the hundreds. In fact, the priests, we have the newspaper where they went to the authorities because their collection plates were getting light. Because <laughs> y'all bring y'all money with you when you go to church. And when you leave a church, you take your money with you too. By reason of kind and gracious insight, the late Cardinal Francis George, God rest his soul, was wise enough to petition the church to open the Declaration of Sainthood for this priest. And in 2010, the authorities in Rome allowed the Roman phase to begin, and we're blessed to have the positio, a finished work best translated as a doctoral dissertation on the life of Father Tolton. It has been scrutinized and will be eventually given to the Holy Father. In fact, we received on March the 8th, 2018, that the six historical consultants to the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints voted unanimously and moved forward to accept his positio without question. Many people worked on that, but no folks worked harder than Dr. Cecilia Moore. Y'all call and tell her thank you when you talk to her again. Nobody worked harder than Father Cyprian Davis. That positio is because of the work of many, but no more greater than Cyprian and, and Cecilia. This means that the research was acceptable. So that moves us to the story being credible, and we have to make sure that the story, his life here on earth, makes a connection with heaven. That's why the miracles are so important. When the heavenly miracles and the earthly story meets, 
It meets within the miracle, if you didn't know that. And the remaining steps of the Vatican's Theological Commission on the virtues of his life and his two miracles that we already have that have been sent to Rome. The first miracle was a seminarian who stopped breathing and they just happened to be with one person left behind, the rest of the seminary staff going to Father Toton's grave for a pilgrimage. So they called the rector of the seminary and said, this boy is not breathing anymore. And he said, you go in there and pray. While we pray at the grave, you pray while the ambulance are on their way. The boy went into a coma. They kept him alive long enough so his mother, when he reached the hospital, could say goodbye. And the mother said, no, we're not pulling the plug. So the priest, one of the priests that had been on the pilgrimage, came to visit the boy and he took Father Toton's prayer card and he placed it on the chest of the young man since they had been praying the intercessory prayer. And that young man who had been brain dead was now in a coma for which the doctor said there was nothing else to do. But a mother said, no, not yet. That young man opened his eyes. He's very ordained and very functional. He probably got more sense than I do. <laughs> That's the first miracle. He's breathing and living and functioning as a Roman Catholic priest today with no deficiencies. All right, all right. The second miracle, the late Francis Cardinal George found out that I was the only African-American student at Catholic Theological Union studying for the priesthood, and he gave me the authority to preach on Sunday in his churches. He gave the priest a one-minute homily and gave me 11 minutes to teach and talk about Tolton's cause, of which a privilege I take very seriously. But there was a woman who came up to me, we'll call her Mama Rose, and she said, Father, I need to speak to you. I said, Mama, I'm not a priest, I'm a seminarian. She says, I got a miracle. I said, on the bottom of the card, it says, report any spiritual physical favors through the prayer of Father Tolton to the office of the Cardinal. I said, Mama, I got to get to class. <laughs> so, about my third gig in, Mama Rose is sitting in the back of every pew. And then I went to a woman's luncheon, and she tried to sit next to me. But the woman next to me wouldn't give up her seat. <laughs> and so I said, oh, I have a stalker. And so I'm headed to the parking lot of my fifth event into my job of telling the story locally in Chicago. And she's standing by my car and she says, brother, I really need to talk to you. I said, mama, you got five minutes because I got to get to class. <laughs> she says, I have a miracle and I want you to take it to the grave of Toton because I can't afford to go on the next pilgrimage. But tell Father Toton, thank you. She begins to lift up her dress. And she, this is what she did. She said, I want to show you something, baby. I said, Mother, I'm a religious. Don't show me. She said, No, no, boy. And she lifted up her dress and showed me her leg. Because Mother's leg was supposed to be cut off. The doctors came into a hospital room and she had gangrene from her ankle to her hip. And she refused that day to let him cut off her leg. And she had been praying the intercessory prayer to Father Toton. And she says, either I'm going to die or I'm going to live. But if I die, I'm still going to live. And her leg is still on her body today. I won't read the whole prayer. But this intercessory prayer, many of you have been praying, and I think the third miracle is in this room. Where you at, sister? Stand up. Sister is working on the third miracle on Father Tolton's life. We need your prayers. That's the most important thing you can do. I won't read the whole prayer, but Father in heaven, Father Tolton's suffering service sheds light on our sorrows. But we see them 
through the prism of your son's passion and death. How many of y'all know it really ain't Tolton's story, it's the gospel story? Complete what you have done. Complete what you have begun in us. So that we might work for the fulfillment of your kingdom. When the glory comes, it will be ours. It will be ours. When the glory comes, it will be ours. It will be ours. To address us on the fifth cause, that of Miss Julia Greeley, I invite Miss Mary Lysing from Colorado, Denver. Good afternoon. afternoon. Julia was an ordinary lady that became extraordinary. Not in one way, not in two ways, but in many ways. Now, she was born in Hannibal, Missouri as an enslaved person. She lost an eye from the whip of a master that was beating her mother. She lived in St. Louis, worked in St. Louis for the Pratt family. She moved to Colorado and took a job with the first territorial governor, Governor Gilpin. And his wife was a devout Catholic. And so Julia started going to daily mass. She was a daily communicant. She was devoted to the Sacred Heart and to our Blessed Mother. The story is, one day one of the parishioners went to Father and said, this lady is here every day sitting in front of the Sacred Heart. Her clothes are tattered. She had one eye, and the and her good eye leaked a lot. And this lady said, we've been in this church for many years, and I think she needs to go. So Father took a deep breath, and he said, if anybody is leaving, it will be you. Okay. Julia walked the streets of Denver, Colorado. She was illiterate. We have no writings or anything about her. Um, so there are no books to read for the Pazizio to check on or make sure she didn't do anything she wasn't supposed to do. But she was a virtuous lady. And in her lifetime, she, we don't have a direct, uh, a correct, I should say, birth date. But she died on the Feast of the Sacred Heart, June 7th. We just celebrated a 100th year anniversary of her death. Now, we removed her remains from Mount Olivet Cemetery. We had a forensic pathologist. And when we, when her remains were exposed, we were told that she had arthritis throughout her body. So she was in pain all the time. But what she did in walking the streets of Denver, she carried a little red wagon. Some of you have seen the, the Little Red Wagon newsletter. She collected food. She would collect clothes, coal, whatever she found out another person needed. And at nighttime, she would go to that person's home and leave those things in front of the door. And she did this under the cover night because she never wanted to embarrass anyone. She was heroic and virtuous. When Archbishop Aquila, well, we made her, chose her 
to be the model of mercy for the Archdiocese of Denver. Archbishop, Archbishop Aquila, Sam Aquila, opened the cause after getting permission from the USCCB. We opened the Gill in 2011. And the reason we had the Gill open is because many people have never heard about Julia Greeley, not even the people in Colorado. So there's a book that Father Blaine Berkey wrote about things that he found out. It's not chronological, so we call it a historical document. But during that time, when she, it, the day that she died, she was on her way to Mass on the Feast of the Sacred Heart. She laid in state for five hours in a Jesuit parish and people walked by her. They didn't know her, black, white, five hours. But she was honored, she was loved, and she was respected. And so the cause was open in 2016, last year, this year. We celebrated the 100th anniversary of her death on June 7th. And on August 10th, we will close the diocesan phase for Julia Greeley and turn everything over to Rome. Now for us, since I've listened to the other causes, that's pretty quick. So Julia's still working in Denver. She's still working. She's making sure that we know about Julia. Now, Julia is now in a sarcophagus in the cathedral. There's no bishop, no priest, no cardinal in the cathedral, but Julia is there. All right? All right? Julia is there. Okay? So here's an enslaved person that her remains are in the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception, the Archbishop's house, our house, yeah. the people's house. Right. And if you get to Denver, please go by and say hello to Miss Julia. Thank you. When I hear stories like this, I am so mindful that this is this is the, really the methodology that the Institute most often uses of bringing scholarship, history, values, story to an oral, oral people in order to help us heal our wounds, both historic and collective. Some, as Patty Gray told us so well, we most often shove down so far that we forget them long enough not to remember that they are working on us and working through us until they heal. But to remember to tell those stories is not only a matter of simply rehearsing the pain, it's about allowing ourselves to overcome. It's about healing the wounds so that we can direct our energy and direct our strength, direct our focus, direct our vision to the tasks that still lie ahead. When I hear these stories today, I'm reminded of an article that Father Cyprian Davis wrote years ago for the National Institute for uh, North American Forum on the Catechumenate, where he took short biographies of African-American people and said, if you are trying to instill the virtue of hospitality, you might want to tell somebody about this person. If you are trying to instill the virtue of forgiveness and community, you might want to lift up the story of this person. You bring us more resources. You bring us more energy. You bring us a greater sense of pride. You bring us a healing balm so that we can do, as Xavier University, as the Institute for Black Catholic Studies, to match scholarship and pastoral ministry so that we not only feed the mind, but the heart, the spirit, and the will.
Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Reverend Canon Jordan, would you please come? And Father Wayne Pacey, I understand that you are going to lead us in a little um, question and answer and maybe a few more remarks, please. And I'm just amazed, y'all. You know, we are ahead of time. Is God good or what? Yes, All right. right. I don't have to introduce to most of you, but I would like to, for those of you who don't know, Father Wayne Pacey, the former director of the Black and Indian Mission, yeah. and also now the pastor of Our Lady of Lewis in Slidell, Louisiana. Father Pacey. Yeah. We've uh, we talked about the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, but I, I need to tell you the how. This endeavor came about and how it came about is very important because how it continues depends on the, how it got started. Um, I called a friend of mine who I've been knowing since I was in fifth grade on the feast of St. Catherine Drexel. And I said, you know, I don't understand. Y'all have done such a great job with Mother Drexel's life. I'm a, I'm a child of Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, by the way. And uh, I've always said that Mother Catherine was my godmother because she looked out for me. And on that feast day, I called a, a friend of mine and I said, Sister, you know, y'all got Mother Catherine throughout the whole world. But when I go to a Catholic charities event, I don't, I don't see Pierre's face in a Catholic charities event. And I said, Sister, you know, when the men met about health care and elder care. I didn't see a picture of Henriette DeLille's face, an example in our Catholic community of what elder care should be, if you don't know that she's on the National Register for such. See, some of us don't know our history. Some of y'all look at me like you ain't never heard this before. <laughs> Fathers of Catholic Charities, a black man, Pierre Toussaint, the founder of elder care and establish it, she's on the National Register. And don't believe me, fact check me. <laughs> and I said, what do I do next? Because I feel like I need to do more. And I said to her, you know, the six candidates, Father Toton's cause is moving at a pace you would not believe. We, in February, we hope to have Father Toton voted on whether he will be canonized, I mean, be called venerable. That's in record time since 2010. I said to her, I said, it's not a competition, it's a communion. Right. And she said, do something about it, boy. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Jane. I was in fourth grade, she was the fifth grade teacher. <laughs> then I called Father Pacey, because he has been a friend to all of us, amen? And he knows where the money's at. <laughs> so he answered all my questions. That's what we want to do now. We had saved this time for something else, but we all agree that perhaps you have questions. And Father Pacey has partnered with us, not just for financial reasons, but because of his wisdom and his time. He, he allowed all six of us to meet at his house. Bishop Perry is the moderator. He brought in some other good people. And we've been working for the last 12 to 24 months on this endeavor. And then we got ourselves together and Dr. Verrett very kindly met with us and agreed along with the Board of Xavier to do this. We want to answer some of your questions. If we could have at least one to two questions on the Pierre Toussaint cause and we'll see what we can do to answer your questions. If you have them. Her question is, what can she do to help? You can all contact Brother Tyrone Davis who is not the postulator, but he's standing in the gap. He is the director for the Office of Black Catholics. And he's, because of his work with the Pierre Toussaint Scholarship Program and his work with the Office for Black Catholics and his willingness to see the cause move, even though they don't have a postulate, anyone who wants to help with that cause, please contact Brother Tyrone Davis, the Office for Black Catholics in the Archdiocese of New York. He will give you very specific directions. I love what's happening here. I'm a young deacon, but I love the beauty I see here. And I have this question. We will have six causes. Can we expect anything collaboratively 
that we can promote these six causes consistently across this country using every form of media that is available to us? That is the perfect question, Deacon. Boy, the Holy Spirit is so much in this room. That is the exact reason for the Xavier University Resource Center coming together with all six candidates so that we have scholarly, definitive, up-to-date, relevant work with the use of the entire community and its resources, whether it be money or wisdom, or whether it be academics and social media, because we cannot do this alone. It's not a competition. It's a communion. The last thing we need is your money. Your prayers are most important. But now, y'all forget this is going to cost us something. The initial budget will be about $200,000 the first year. And if we have our way and Dr. Barrett's wisdom comes together, we will have eight endowed chairs, one with Mother Catherine Drexel as an endowed chair, St. Kateri Tekarutha as an endowed chair, and the other six candidates all with an endowed chair here as a long-term goal. That's the vision. That's, I mean, right there you're talking about $8 million. So please pray, but also pray and with the money. Dr. Brett, do you have anything you want to add to these questions and statements that we're making? Um, we are, we're beginning with the small construction, the, the foundation is going to make this occur. And we need a lot of work. And as Father mentioned, we need love, lots of prayers to make it happen. But we'll come to pass. And may I add that although that budget seems a bit much, we're going to start off very small, baby steps. So, you know, um, if I'm not talking out of turn, Father, um, you know, we're trying to get a part-time director and a part-time secretary to assist here at Xavier. And, of course, we're going to need m a plenty of volunteers. And that's something you may want to discuss among yourselves. We need volunteers as we move forward with establishing the resource center. But we're going to start very small. We're going to try to keep the budget very low initially. But as it grows, we're going to need more funding. So by the grace of God, we're going to continue to uh, open our hearts and prayers and the Lord's going to, going to give us what we need. But we're starting with baby steps. And the most important thing is to pray, 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 and to give of your time to promote this National Resource Center here at Xavier because it helps all of us. And as Father pointed out, it's not only for the black community, it's for the universal church. We have to educate people of all races about the gifts of our black sisters and brothers. Thank you, Father. I believe in being direct about things, and one of the things I want to be very direct to, with all of you about, we will never make this a reality if we don't learn who we are, all that we have to offer this church of ours, and make it a reality. Those of you that are still young and restless and sit on the edge of night need to be at the Institute of Black Catholic Studies. You know, that's the best way you can volunteer and make this a reality. So I'm just, uh, I just wanted to say that. I just feel I had to say that. Amen? Sometimes you just got to make it plain. Amen? Stan, let's pray. And then we don't need to stop there. That's just where we start. Because there's other programs that we have to continue to make sure they continue in our name for our benefit. But uh, if you have any questions about those, see me. I'll be glad to explain what I'm talking about. And I'm talking to deacons and their wives. I'm talking to seminarians. I'm talking to even some of the priests in this room. Those of us that have gone through the Institute, we can tell you, I went through seminary all those years and never heard one thing about a black person in scripture. I've been in Catholic schools all my life. 
and never learned about the value of what it means for me to be who I am. So I just want to say that. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. We ask our God to bless us and and keep us. May his face shine upon us, be gracious to us. May the Lord fill us with his kindness and peace now and always as we live and abide in him. May God bless us all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen.